Hello. Hello. Uh. Hello. Hello. Check. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Okay. I will talk double speed. I'll talk at double speed. Double speed. I'm just saying, I need to leave it. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I completely understand. Not because your talk was dead. Yeah. You know, no, if you, if you, uh, if you um, stayed for my talk and abandoned the son of the airport, I would probably blame you. Oh. Oh, you have to speak something. Hello? Hey, it's picking up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, it's good. Okay. 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 Ah. Okay. Okay. Um, no, because I can always write on this. That's the convenient thing about this. I can use them both ways. I will not be offended at all if you walk out after the first slide. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the ICTS String Seminar. So today we have Vijay Bal Subramanian who will be talking to us about the origin of black hole entropy. Great, well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. It's a real pleasure to be back. Last time I was here, I think this hall was in existence. I can't quite remember, but uh, everything over there was barely not in existence. The second floor, there were no railings, so you could walk straight off and come down very fast. There was no place to stay, you know, it was, so, Come a long way. It's really beautiful. I've been taking walks in the evening. So congratulations. It's really nice here. Physics camp meets a garden. My, you know, my, my idea of heaven. So it's perfect. Anyway, so today I will uh, try to make some comments about the origin of uh, black hole entropy. So uh, this work is all everything I know about this stuff. I learned from collaboration with Javier Magan, who's uh, now a professor at uh, Bariloche in Argentina. Martin Sacieta, who's now a postdoc at Brandeis, and Albin Lawrence, who's a professor at Brandeis. Um, if time permits, which it almost certainly won't, I'll wind up making some comments about the complexity of black hole microstates. And that's work done with Arjun Kar, who's going to five year postdoc at Perimeter, uh, Onkar Parikar, whom you know very well, who's at TIFR, Harshit Rajgadia, who's a uh, graduate student in TIFR. Kathy Lee, my student, and Kathy Lee, my student, and also papers with uh, Javier Magan, Pavel Kaputa and Austin Wu, who's one of my students. Great. So um, let me start out by introducing the problem to you. So, that, um, so as all, most of you know, uh, perhaps not all, uh, already in 1973, Beckenstein, Bad, Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking made an argument that black holes carry an entropy uh, given by the formula area of the horizon times the speed of light cubed divided by four G Newton H bar. Now, the really remarkable thing about this formula is it's completely universal. It applies to black holes of any mass, angular momentum, charge, and space-time dimension, and doesn't make any reference, for example, to the need for or any particular ultraviolet completion of gravity in a quantum theory. Or in a quantum theory. So what were their arguments, these authors? Their arguments went as follows. They constructed a bunch of thought experiments in which they considered how black hole solutions change when matter passes through the horizon. And by thinking about experiments like that, they concluded that the change in mass or energy of the black hole is equal to kappa, the surface gravity times the change in area, that in all classical processes, at least, the area is non-decreasing and the surface gravity is constant across the surface of the black hole. And they observed that this is, of course, all a formal analogy to the uh, laws of thermodynamics with area being assigned a meaning of entropy. They also wrote in these papers, don't take this too seriously, because if there was a thermodynamic analogy, then black holes would evaporate and everybody knows they don't. But of course, two years later, Hawking discovered Hawking radiation, where you have a horizon, and then let's say you have quantum pair production just outside the horizon, one particle falls in, one goes out, and the stuff going out radiates away with the temperature kappa, which seems to then complete the analogy and say that there is some sense in which you should think about the area of the horizon as having a thermodynamic meaning. So it's also useful to consider a more formal argument that Gibbons and Hawking devised uh, some years later in 1978. Uh, we're going to use this argument quite extensively, or the style of argument, so I'm going to review it for you. And um, in that argument, uh, let's, it's first useful to consider a theory without gravity, a quantum, field, a quantum field theory with some fields phi and an action i. So they observed, or reminded everybody, that the path integral in Euclidean signature and that is to say you take t to i times tau with a periodic time, tau identified the tau plus beta actually computes the partition function of the theory. How does that work? Well, the partition function is the trace of e to the minus beta Hamiltonian. The path integral representation of this trace is you integrate over fields with periodic boundary conditions on time, e to the minus one over h bar times the integral of the action evaluated with, again, with periodic boundary conditions in circular time. So often, this kind of path integral is very difficult to do. So you approximate it when you can, um, uh, semi-classically. And the semi-classical approximation amounts to saying that you consider the saddle points of this action, and you write down that this integral is approximately e to the minus beta 
uh, uh, of the saddle point action. Now, of course, if you've got multiple saddle points, you should sum over the saddle points, you know, things of this nature. And when you can do it, this is a very convenient way to approximate the path integral. Of course, you can do corrections around the saddle point, you can add the determinant and so on. In this analogy or in this equation, we would identify the action, the saddle point action is the free energy of the system. And then the entropy, if this is conventional thermodynamics, would be given by beta dd beta minus one acting upon the action. So that's the conventional way of deriving um, you know, the entropy in a quantum field theory setting. If you want to do gravity, if you want to apply this to gravity, it's a bit more complicated. We take T to I tau Euclidean continuation. We make tau the time circular. So we take tau identified to tau plus beta. Um, we uh, take an action for gravity, and the action is going to involve the Ricci scalar, the cosmological constant, um, some extrinsic curvature terms at the boundary to get well-defined equations of motion, and uh, also possible counter terms uh, to render the action finite when this kind of thing is possible. So following the previous philosophy, we should try to compute the trace of e to the minus beta Hamiltonian. That is roughly speaking, e to the minus beta times the saddle point action. So we need to compute the saddle points of this action. That's the solutions to the equation of motion. And a uh, solution that you can find here is of this form. This is actually the Euclidean black hole. And if you look at it, what happens is that time is a circle out of infinity, but the, um, it's shrinking as you go towards the origin, shall we say. And this kind of geometry is called a cigar geometry. This dot here is Euclidean horizon. And if you look at it from the right, from this side, it looks like a disk. So I'll often draw it as a disk with the dot at the origin there being the Euclidean horizon. So I'll keep drawing these pictures uh, periodically. Now, um, um, once again, you can evaluate the saddle point action, take d beta dd beta minus one of the saddle point action by the usual prescription. This is supposed to give you the entropy, and it turns out to be the area divided by four g newton. So this is a formal justification, assuming that the Euclidean path integral for gravity in some sense exists. If you assume that, well, that's a big assumption in some sense, right? If you assume that, you get this argument for the entropy of a black hole. And these pictures apply readily to vanishing and negative cosmological constant, flat and ADS spaces. But for positive cosmological constant, which is de Sitter space, is a bit different, a little bit more complicated, since the Euclidean geometry actually has no boundary, it is a sphere. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to ignore positive cosmological constants because they introduce their own special class of complications. So suppose somebody tells you there's a system that has an entropy, then it behooves us for, to ask, what is the origin of the entropy? So Gibbs and Boltzmann, almost more than 100 years ago, taught us but if a physical system carries an entropy, then normally that entropy should be counting, well, should be computing the log, the logarithm of the number of microstates that are consistent with the macroscopic parameters. So the program of the entire field of statistical physics is you give me a macroscopic system with some entropy, and then what I'm supposed to go and do is work out all the microstates, count up the microstates, take the log of the number of microstates, and then I should get the entropy. Of course, you know, if you do the canonical ensemble, the microcanonical ensemble, there are sort of differences, slight differences, but overall the program is to count the number of microstates. So what approaches have we had towards this problem? So one very interesting class of approaches is to give a precise count of the microstate and string theory. After all, this is supposed to be a quantum theory of gravity. Actually, the first paper I was given to read by my PhD advisor was a paper by uh, Ashok here, um, which was trying to talk about uh, the entropy of black holes from a microscopic point of view uh, um, in those days. So it's turned out that um, uh, this kind of counting, um, uh, you know, the, that kind of approach to counting was brought to, I would say, a pitch of uh, perfection, if you like, by Strominger and Bafa in 1996. And let me remind you what they do. They were able to count the microstates of black holes, you know, precisely and get area over 4G Newton in certain classes of special cases. And these special cases had lots of broken supersymmetry. The theory had 32 supercharges broken to 16. The supersymmetry helped because then you could take the theory at reasonable coupling where there was a horizon, turn the coupling and make it almost equal to zero while still preserving degeneracy because of supersymmetry. The horizon disappears and this thing becomes a bound state of D brains. And then you quantize that bound state and try to compute the number of bound states that we can write down. That's what they did. So it's in a regime where there isn't really a horizon. But if that's okay, you know, the degeneracy is preserved because of the supersymmetry, so that's the way they went. And in this theory, to get everything to work out, it's in a full-fledged string theory. So it has extra dimensions, brains, multiple electric and magnetic charges, and all kinds of things. It's a beautiful argument. The 
um, sad thing about it, you might say from the point of view of the original Bekenstein Hawking formula is it's not universal. It's got lots of special features embedded into it in order to get the precision involved in this. And these things definitely don't look like astrophysical black holes, different number of dimensions, brains, extra dimensions and stuff like that. So there's some gap between what we would hope for a universal answer to why the entropy works out the way it does. Another approach that has come up in the uh, meantime is the so-called fuzzball approach where the argument uh, originally due to Mathur and Lunin and pursued uh, in depth also by Bena and Warner goes like this. Suppose I give you a particular black hole microstate, then, well, there's no entropy there, there's one microstate. So this should be somehow horizon less. This ignores the point that if you have a state that is very, very complicated, coarse grained observers may still interact with it as if it has an entropy because you need know, coarse grained configurations or something, but that's okay. In some true sense, if it's a pure state, there's no horizon uh, or there's no entropy, so there should be no horizon. So they look for horizon less microstate geometries. Beautiful work. Again, requires lots of supersymmetry, extra dimensions and lots of moving parts in order to find the solutions and have them stable even in order to be able to tell you what the solutions are, but still beautiful to do. And um, the challenges or the sad thing about it, about this approach from the point of view of a universal explanation is that it's also not universal. Lots of special cases need to be included. Um, they're not like black holes in nature because of all of us, uh, so the special conditions. And also thus far, not enough such states have been identified to account for the black hole entropy. Okay? So those are some challenges in this approach. There are other approaches. So for example, going back all the way back to the work of Holzi, Larson, Wilczek and Suskind and Ruglum, there is the notion that actually maybe black hole entropy is an entanglement entropy between interior and exterior degrees of freedom. Now the challenges with that are if you try to do that in quantum field theory, the quantity diverges. And so then, you know, then you have to understand the regulator and what that means and so on. And it's not really completely clear how to compute this in string theory. Understanding entanglement entropy in string theory proper is still a work in progress. Okay. So we might step away from these approaches and then consider the puzzle in a different light. So here's another way of thinking about the puzzle. So here's the black hole, here's the horizon. And I'm going to define what I might call a semi-classical microstate as a state of the system, a microstate of the system um, that's described in effective field theory, right? So in the low energy theory of the system and um, the low energy effective field theory, I'm gonna to take to be um, uh, uh, low energy theory, I'm gonna to take to be effective field theory coupled to matter with a fixed exterior geometry. So the notion here, is that what do you mean by microstate of a black hole? Well, in order to be this black hole, the geometry outside the horizon needs to stay fixed. But you're free to do whatever you want inside the horizon because I can't see it anyway. And all of those things should act like microstates of a black hole, so long as the stuff that you see outside looks the same. So as it turns out, there appear to be vastly more such states than the Hilbert space dimension set by the black hole entropy. That's because imagine you can put down a tennis ball inside the black hole, feel free. You can put down a different tennis ball, another tennis ball in a different place, et cetera. You can pack very many different kinds of tennis balls behind the horizon of a black hole. And you'll find there are many more ways of doing this while keeping the overall mass fixed than uh, e to the area over 4G Newton. In other words, this is like the argument of, John, uh, uh, of Wheeler about the bags of, gold, of, about bags of gold geometries, which have on the inside, you can pack many more things um, at least naively, than warranted for the black hole horizon. So the puzzle from this point of view isn't that we don't have our hands on enough states, right? So in the, I was earlier presenting the puzzle as where are the states? You know, I can't get my hands on the states. From this point of view, there are lots of states that are way, way too many states, ridiculously many states, and there are just too many of them, so there's something wrong there too. So we're going to start with this formulation of the puzzle, that there are too many states, at least from the low energy point of view, and we're going to try to address it. So I want to think about this, so I'm going to start by telling you our approach and our results, just in case I don't get to the end of the talk, okay? So here's our goal. The goal or idea of this talk is that actually, unlike the notion in Strominger and Waffa, and unlike the work by Lunin, Bena, Warren, and others, we don't actually need to find a very specific family of cleverly chosen, you know, uh, orthogonal microstates or anything like that. I don't care what the microstates are. I just need to count them. So I just need to show that all these states span a Hilbert space of dimension e to the black hole entropy. I don't care what the states are. I just don't know the dimension of the span, right? So we're gonna to try to make up an argument for that. 
And the way we'll do that, our approach is going to be, I'm going to construct an infinite family of well-controlled semi-classical microstates. So these are going to be things that naively, vastly oversaturate the entropy because they're all, you'll see, they're perfectly well-controlled, they're semi-classical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are way too many of them. Then I'm going to construct the gram matrix of overlaps between these states. That is a matrix consisting of, you know, state one overlap, state two, state two overlap, state three, you know, matrix of this kind. And then I'm going to compute the rank of this matrix. By definition in linear algebra, the rank of this matrix is the dimension of the Hilbert space spanned by these states. So we're going to compute that. And we're going to find several beautiful things. The first thing we'll find is that indeed it turns out that the entropy, the log dimension of the Hilbert space, is precisely area over 4G Newton. Right? That's exactly what comes out. I'll argue to you also that this is a complete basis and that essentially this is a universal explanation for the entropy of black holes. That's what I'll try to argue to you. Then many other ex, uh, extra things come out. First of all, I'm going to do all of these calculations in anti de Sitter space, and I'm going to do that anti de Sitter space because in ADS space, we have lots of control over the dual conformal field theory. So I can really justify to you that the constructions I'm doing, you should believe me because I could do the same constructions in, in the conformal field theory, and you'd agree that they were perfectly reasonable calculations to do. So for that reason, I'm going to do them in ADS space. And then if I have time in the end, I'll mention how the same calculations can be done exactly the same way in flat space with minor differences, and they can be done for collapsing geometry. So this is in that sense for flat space and negative cosmological constants. This is a, I'm going to propose that this is a universal explanation. Another very interesting thing that comes out that we won't have time to discuss is there will be an outcome uh, from this work that long wormholes can be regarded as superpositions of short wormholes. So we'll do a computation that shows that. And that's going to be corollary of our results, which will then suggest that volume uh, in quantum gravity is not a linear operator in, uh, is volume is not linear operator in, in quantum gravity. So we'll have some, some comments about that. I, have, I haven't even started my talk and already there are questions. I'm not going to finish this talk. <laughs> Uh, but the, the, the usual objection to the program, so since before- Why don't you let me finish what I'm actually going to say and then object? I'm not objecting to, I'm just, uh, I just want to, want to uh, prelude answer to how, how you, would be that this would be UV sensitive, right? You would have overlaps- It's not going to be UV sensitive. You should wait for me to do the calculation. It's not UV sensitive. That's the point. So here we go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, this is also an expert level question, but you should wait for afterwards. I'm not going to compute the subleading corrections. I'm going to give you the leading, leading answer. Well, yeah, of course, there have to be subleading corrections. And in fact, I know various groups are trying to compute those in this approach, but the results are not out, so we can't comment them. And if those come out wrong, for example, if you don't match the walled entropy, then there's an issue that you have to think about. Yeah, great. So, all right, so I'm going to start out by telling you how to construct these uh, well-controlled microstates. And when I compute the overlaps of that, we will want to discuss whether or not the answer that I'm computing is or is not UV sensitive. And I'll try to argue to you that it isn't UV sensitive. Okay. So for simplicity, I'm going to construct, start with time reflection symmetric states in asymptotically anti visitor spaces. This is, in, this is entirely for convenience in this talk. You don't have to do this. So, what would, that means we're going to consider microstates, if you like, of the eternal black hole as opposed to the one-sided black hole formed from collapse. So here's the horizon. Here's the usual Penrose diagram. Here's the horizon. Here is the future and past singularity and the two boundaries of space-time. So as you know, if I take the equal time section of this geometry, of this Penrose, uh, of this Penrose diagram, the equal time geometry looks like the wormhole. It looks like an Einstein-Rosen bridge between two asymptotic universes with, you know, there's the two horizons I'm cutting through here, and this is the region of the wormhole in between. So that's the usual picture of this wormhole. Now, the semi-classical microstates, or rather microstates which are under semi-classical control that I wish to construct are going to be like this. They're going to be basically shells of matter that I insert behind the horizon. And um, if you like, it's a, it's, a, it's a dust ball, a shell of dust, that emerges from the past singularity, goes into the future singularity. Not, it doesn't really matter exactly what's going to happen here. I'll tell you how we'll construct the states in, in detail. And each of these things is going to wind up looking 
like an external region that's completely unchanged from the original black hole. It's going to be exactly the same, but behind the horizon, you have this shell of matter and the wormhole becomes longer. So there's a collection of longer wormholes with shells between them, behind them. And I would like to say, claim that these are like microstates because, well, you know, the exterior geometry is the same in every case. So, you know, these are, these are microstates of the system. Of course, they are highly atypical microstates. These are not the generic microstate, but I don't care. All I want to do is to make enough microstates that I will later claim to, have, to form a basis and to show you what their dimension is. I really don't care that the typical state you're going to make for collapsing stuff is not going to be this dust ball. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. So that's that's a, so you have to find the saddle point, and when you build a saddle point, the wormhole lengthens. So that's just a, that's an outcome as opposed to an input. So because right, yeah. What's that? I haven't thrown along. Uh, nothing's coming in from infinity. Yeah. So it's important that we don't drop it in from infinity because if we did, then of course the horizon would move out. Right. Correct, correct. And then you'd have a thing like, I'll, I'll make some comments about that later. There's also one group that's currently working on taking a thing like this and then throwing something in later. And then you should see that the horizon areas increased and blah, 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 you know, questions of that kind that can also be addressed in this. But exactly. So how can we construct such states and believe that they're under control? So let's remember how we're supposed to do this in quantum field theory and using the standard ADS-CFT dictionary. The usual ADS-CFT, as you know, the eternal black hole is dual to a thermal field double state, that's this one, in a product of two Hilbert spaces, H left cross H right. So we take uh, you know, energy eigenstates of the left in the left theory and energy eigenstates of the right theory, multiply them by E to the minus beta times the energy over two, we sum up, and that's a thermal field double state. So that's a now well-established uh, fact that we uh, mostly agree with. So now, let me remind you how you're supposed to construct this thermal field double state using a Euclidean path integral. So let me start with these two theories on the boundary. So I'm gonna think only about the boundary and think about the dual CFT. So on the ADS boundary, I'm supposed to do a path integral where I have a no boundary, you know, uh, you, you take the cylinder that's going in this way, you evolve by Euclidean time beta over two in these two directions. And then the state you produce in the CFT by time evolving this way at t equals zero, if you slice the Euclidean path integral open, that is the thermal field double state. That is a standard construction in quantum field theory, so we believe it, right? Because it's been done so many times before. The dual picture in gravity is like this. So now what I'm doing is I'm actually slicing. The, uh, so you fill in the bulk, and then I'm slicing the bulk, instead of slicing down the bulk. And so back here, at t, uh, before t equals zero, you have the Euclidean black hole. That is the bulk geometry. I've taken the Euclidean version of this Lorentzian black hole geometry. So you're supposed to take boundary, uh, 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 evolve the uh, gravitational path integral forward to the time t equals zero. Over here, the origin is the Euclidean horizon. And then to get the Lorentzian geometry out of this, you're supposed to take the state you get to at t equals zero and splice it in to a Lorentzian geometry on top of that. So that's the usual picture of how you construct thermal field double state in both the field theory and the gravity side of this picture. Now, suppose you wanted to make in the field theory a different state, what would you do? Well, here's the thing you could do. Here's the CFT. I'll take a cloud of local operators and put them in a nice spherically symmetric configuration. They don't have to be spherically symmetric, but it's convenient, let's say, over here. And then I'm going to evolve for an amount of time, beta tilde over two to the left and beta tilde over two to the right. And if I do that, the state I will construct involves, you know, here's O and M, the uh, operator matrix elements in the energy basis. And you evolve that up in time on both this side and on this side in the two Hilbert spaces. And this is the state that you will construct at a finite time, right? At t equals zero. This is also a standard Euclidean construction of a state in a CFT after insertion of these operators at the uh, origin of time. So we are going to pick the operator O to have a semi-classical dual, namely a dual picture in gravity where gravity, you know, classical gravity gives a reasonable description of what's going on. So that is to say, we are going to use these operators to create a spherical cloud of dust particles. So one way of doing this is if phi is an operator in the CFT with some dimension delta phi, 
then I consider an operator, which is a product of many phi's. And then the dimension of O is going to be like N delta phi, right? So it depends, right? I mean, so, but you can make it N like, it's going to go like N, the number of operators you add. And I'm going to pick delta phi to be about one. So I'm going to take each of these operators as creating a, lot, a light, uh, as creating a light dust particle. And then I'm going to take N, the number of dust particles I put in, to go as like one over G Newton, because I want this thing to have a large back reaction. I want to make it a big thing. It's a big classical thing, which has a back reaction on the geometry. So I'm going to make states of this kind. Okay. So what's the gravitational description of this construction? Yeah. So this will come up again later. So this is a, um, I, I should have commented upon that. So when you do this construction, what you want to guarantee is that the geometry outside the horizon is unchanged. So if you don't do this construction carefully, that won't happen. I'll, I'll illustrate this. I, sh I should have left the comment out here. I'll draw a picture in a minute that'll make it completely obvious what, what, what that comment is supposed to be. So just give me, just give me 30 seconds. So that, yeah. At all. No, that's part of the point about the universality of the thing. It's completely irrelevant what the operator is. We are going to, you can use, we are going to use single trace operators. The phi is a single trace operator, but then it's a product of single trace. It's a multi-particle state. So if you feel a discomfort with, with these objects, if you feel a discomfort with these objects, um, uh, so uh, let me remind you that of papers by uh, Tom Hartman, Alicia Bernamonti, uh, Federico Galli, and others, let's say 10 years ago, in which they construct a system with operators of this kind inserted at the boundary of ADS. So that's not behind the horizon. They're not doing this kind of Euclidean construction that it basically injects in the usual ADS CFD way, you know, large number of particles in the boundary. That's a shell, that's a, that's a shock wave, a shell. Um, thermalization in a shock wave uh, geometry. This is something that, for example, was studied uh, in a paper myself and Ben Crafts and a bunch of other people uh, some years ago. And you can compute, for example, how the two-point function thermalizes. You can compute how the entanglement entropy thermalizes. Tom and company then proceeded to take this CFT thing and then use you know, heavy, heavy, light, light kind of techniques and things of this kind to actually compute similar quantities in the CFT and found that they could match it exactly. So let me offer that as a piece of evidence that you should trust that you can make these states in the CFT. And certainly once I go into gravity, I really don't care if the multi-trace thing somehow involves complicated interactions between these and so on. Once I have the gravity description of this using HKLL near the boundary of space, I'm just gonna let it run in the bulk and then use the bulk gravity to compute the overlaps between these states. I'm just trying to justify, you should believe me, I can make these states because in the CFT, if I feel like applying a large number of single trace operators in a spherically symmetric roughly way at the boundary, you can't stop me, I can do it. And it's a valid operation in the field theory. And the standard dictionary would then tell you, you have injected a shell of dust. Okay. Okay. So what's the gravitational description of this? So as we just said, this is like saying you go to the past Euclidean boundary and insert a shell of matter. Or in greater detail, you filled in, you know, the cylinder that is the Euclidean geometry, and you've inserted there a shell of matter. You've inserted operators in the boundary and evolved them. So if you evolve forward in time, you can work out that there is a saddle point in the theory in, uh, 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 in a general relativity coupled to a shell of dust. So the shell of dust is going to, you know, it's going to have a stress tensor determined by all these operators and so on. But it's not going to matter for the calculations, it turns out, the details of any of that. Other than that, there's some stress energy, which is some energy density times, you know, some u mu, u mu, and there's some local mass to the thing that is the integrated value of the total energy density on this, on this shell. And what's going to happen is if I look at this geometry, the shell is moved forward in Euclidean time. And on one side, let's call the geometry plus, and the other side, the geometry minus. Okay? And in the saddle point, and so here you have to use the Israel junction conditions to match the geometry to the two sides. And on either side, you will find a piece of the Euclidean black hole. It's the two Euclidean black holes that are spliced together um, uh, at the surface of a shell using the Israel junction conditions. So on either side, you have the standard Euclidean black hole geometry. This is the usual one. And uh, the shell itself follows some trajectory given by this equation of motion with an effective potential that's determined by the 
um, by the, uh, by the uh, Israel junction conditions. As it turns out, there are infinitely many solutions of this kind with the same exterior mass, right? Literally infinitely many solutions. You can make this whatever you want, right? And you could wonder, oh, wait, if you make the shell, the dust so dense that it's all Planck scale, then you might worry. But actually already by the time that you can check that with the densities that are lower than sort of Planck densities, well lower than the Planck density, you still have way too many of these kinds of states uh, than you'd expect from the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So these look like microstates because the exterior geometries are all the same and you're doing different things inside. So let's consider that maybe they are, or maybe we should think about them like that. And I'm going to move forward a bit. So one thing we want, if we want to think about these as being sort of microstates, is that we want the shell to always be behind the horizon. So let's consider what happened, what it looks like. On one side, the geometry is the Euclidean black hole. The Euclidean black hole has a disk geometry like this, remember, with some metric on it. Here is the Euclidean horizon. So I need the shell to be on the left side of the Euclidean horizon. And for the other side, you know, for the, the geometry of this side, you need the shell to be on the right side of the Euclidean horizon. That's so that you're always behind the horizon. So what does this mean? Well, this trajectory of the shell is entirely determined by its equations of motion. And there's a certain amount of time, Euclidean time that elapses in this way. So that's called delta tau r. And the right side, there's a certain amount of Euclidean time that elapses. And the sum of this beta tilde r and delta tau r had better equal beta r, which is the temperature of the inverse temperature of the black hole, if you want to keep the exterior geometry fixed. Rajesh, this is what I was talking about. You need to sort of tune things so that it stays behind the horizon for this purpose. So, Vati, you have a question? Sorry, I guess one question. If you take internal black hole. What's that? Take the internal, start with the internal black hole. I'm just asking if this other method is valid. You go to very late times when the, the volume of the slice becomes very large, and you just act with a lot of field operators, which you can construct using HKLN on late times, so they can be very dilute because the volume. And you run it forward or backward, whichever way you and want. This is the same thing. Right? This is exactly the same thing. So uh, I'm just giving you a Euclidean construction of this because I'm just trying to nail it in that I can do the standard thing that I'm supposed to do in ADS CFT and make these states and. Um, and what's more, then I'm going to use the Euclidean construction to compute the overlaps of states. But it's exactly what you said, right? Go to a very early time slice of the eternal black hole and apply lots of operators, make a little, little dust ball and run it up in time and run it back in time. Yeah? And, and I should be pr perfectly permitted to do such a thing, right? There's nothing wrong with that, especially because I can make it as dilute as I want uh, at early times, right? Okay. And then the equation of motion should sort of take it away from that. Okay. So you do similarly on the right side. And then, you know, you splice at t equals zero and do a Lorentzian continuation. Here's what you'll find. The Euclidean construction involves Euclidean geometry with a shell behind the horizons. Those are the two horizons. At t equals zero, you match on to the appropriate, you know, Lorentzian geometry. And what do you know? You have a shell that passes behind the horizon of the black hole. And if you want to then time reverse and make this eternal, then you would have this kind of geometry. Now, the shell that you put in behind the horizon has a mass, local mass, that's much greater than one over G Newton. In fact, you can make it have a mass much greater than the mass of the black hole. And that might seem very confusing. How can you put something behind the black hole that's heavier than the black hole in the first place? Well, it's because of the back reaction in this system and of the funny things about which way time points at infinity and which way time points in the interior. And so if you work that all out, you can in fact insert things that locally have a stress tensor that locally gives you an apparent mass, local mass, that's bigger than the mass of the black hole. But globally, if you go measure the mass using Gauss's law at infinity, you won't actually find that. I mean, this is analogous to, I mean, you can do this kind of thing, right? We know this from Hawking radiation. You make two particles outside the horizon. One falls in, one falls out. For some reason, the one falling in has negative mass. What does that mean? Even though locally it has positive mass, that's because of the differences in time with inside and outside. Just like the bags of gold, sorry. We are going to use bags of gold and in a good way. Okay, so let me comment on how this works for asymptotically flat one-sided black holes. Um, so basically, so many components of this talk are available in bits and pieces in all kinds of work that all of us as a community have done over decades. But I think that this talk is trying to put these things together in a nice way. That's a precise calculation, we'll see. So suppose you want to do asymptotically flat one-sided black holes, you can do a similar construction. So here's the horizon of the black hole, and you have here a shell of matter going behind. 
So then you'll find that the geometry on one side of the shell here is flat space. Remember, this is the origin in this kind of Penrose diagram. Over here, it's the black hole. So what does the geometry look like if I take a slice through it? Then if you look at the slice, then looking in from the exterior, you'll find that you have the exterior region, you have the horizon, you have some interior region here that looks, still looks like black hole. There's a shell, and then it caps off smoothly with a little piece of flat space inside. Okay, so this is precisely, as Sobrat just noted, this is precisely like the bags of gold scenarios that uh, uh, Wheeler originally talked about. So we've, we've constructed a whole bunch of geometries that realize, if you like, the bags of gold of Wheeler. Okay, so let me summarize where we are so far, because I'm sort of done with the first end, a uh, substantial section of the talk. So here are our stakes. I'm going to name them psi m. The mass m can range from some m naught to infinity m naught. I'm taking some minimum mass here so that these things all have large back reaction because I want them to have back reaction. They all look like shells passing behind the horizon. And now I want to make a point that's kind of interesting and that will be relevant for us later. Suppose you took this dust, this dust shell, this dust ball, and moved one of the particles by a tiny Planck amount. Well, the classical geometry I've written down certainly won't notice. So there are many microstates of that kind in which you move the particles by a tiny amount that are actually going to have the same semi-classical description. And therefore, the actual calculation I'm going to do of overlaps within these states will give the same semi-classical answer, even though there are tiny Planck scale differences. Well, this will become relevant for us later. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, this will become relevant for us later. So I just want to mention that. So these are, you know, the gravitational, the low energy gravitational description is indeed of necessity coarse grained relative to whatever microscopic description you have. And the point is going to be the microscopic detail is going to be irrelevant, as we will see in a second. Okay. So naively, our problem then, going back to the beginning of this talk, is that these states span an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Right? And uh, oh, these seem to be notes I wrote to myself after a talk I gave at Santa Barbara on this, but I don't know what they say. Marov and Fu. <laughs> okay. I should, I should go look at one of Don's papers, I think. Okay, anyhow. So, um, so okay, they naively span an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. But you know, these states, oh, that's a naive statement. Because just because semi-classically two you know, tennis balls are different states, you know, quantum mechanically, they can have some small overlap. So we have to compute that overlap and see if you can get control over that overlap to see uh, you know, what the true dimension of the Hilbert space is. So the question is, can you reliably calculate the dimension of the space spanned by these states? That's the game, that's the game we should now uh, go after. So let's try. So our dust ball states have the following form, psi i, um, uh, uh, are states of mass m sub i. And I understand in the back of my head that if I pick a mass m sub i, I'm picking one representative of the many Planck scale different states um, uh, that are different. You know, there are many, many of these things. I'm going to pick one, and it'll have a certain semi classical description, the same as the semi classical descriptions of the other things that are described, that are differing a little bit at the Planck scale. So we want to know what is the dimension of the space they span. Okay, so that's a linear algebra question. To answer this linear algebra question, you proceed, a standard approach is to proceed as follows. First, you construct a thing called the Gram matrix. The Gram matrix, the matrix of overlap, psi i, psi j. So the entry g i, g, uh, let's say the one, two entry is psi i overlap, psi two. So the trick is going to be how to calculate that in a way that we trust ourselves. And then we want to calculate the rank of g. A standard way of trying to compute the rank of a matrix like this is to compute the trace of the so-called resolvent. What is the resolvent? You take the, so, so the resolvent is one over lambda times the identity minus the matrix in question. And the trace is, well, you take the trace of it. These are techniques, by the way, that I personally first learned from the old matrix model literature. Like, you know, it's very, it's very prevalent there. So you take this thing. Um, Paul, I know, Spenta, this appeared first time in one of your papers or something. I'm not sure, did it? Okay, well, anyway, I learned this from the matrix model literature of your. Okay, fine. So you have this uh, trace of the resolvent. And the trace of the resolvent is going to be equal to omega, which is the dimension of, the, uh, uh, of this matrix. The dimension, not the rank, the dimension of the matrix divided by the eigenvalue. Uh, the lambda is going to be the eigenvalues. And you can write this as a power series, you know, a geometric series in powers of, in this case, the gram matrix. So there is a standard statement. That the eigenvalue density then 
of the gram matrix, and that's what we're going to be interested in, is the discontinuity across the real axis of the trace of the resolvent. So you compute the discontinuity across the real axis, there's some one over two pi i's, and that is going to be the eigenvalue density. So the number of vanishing eigenvalues, um, uh, uh, so from this, we can compute the number of vanishing eigenvalues. How many eigenvalues are zero? So the rank of the matrix G is its dimension minus the number of vanishing eigenvalues. So that's going to be what we're going to do. So we need to just compute this matrix, and then we're done. We're going to make it large, compute it, and then make it larger and compute it, and you'll see. Okay. So now it's possibly, well, it's going to be, well, we're free to pick a bag of states as big as we want. So I'm going to pick a bag of states with 10 of these dust balls, then 20 of these dust balls, 30 of these dust balls. I'm going to just make the state space that I pick bigger and bigger and bigger. And if I make it too small, I'm going to preview the answer. If I pick 10 dust balls, I'm going to find that the rank of this matrix is 10. But if I pick a bazillion dust balls, I'm going to find that the rank of this matrix is area over 4G Newton. So I'm going to pick a fixed but large basis. And then I'm going to send that to infinity. Right? And then um, ask me this question again. You may have a novel objection that I haven't heard before to the construction, which would be good. Then we can, we can try to address it. But can you wait for another two minutes? Right? Uh, what, or unless it's urgent. Okay, wait for two minutes. I know you have to leave in 15. So at... 13 minutes from now, if I haven't let you ask your question, I will certainly let you ask your question. Okay. So we want to calculate overlaps of this kind. Psi m, psi m prime. And because we're taking traces, there will be also psi m, psi m prime, psi m prime, psi m, and so on and so forth, you know, products. It's actually important that this m and this m matches because it's going to turn out that we're going to try to argue that, you know, strictly speaking, there are random phases involved in microstates. That's partly what you're going after they will actually cancel for this particular object. So you can calculate in semi-classical gravity. So that's just a preview if it helps allay your suspicions and fears. So, okay, and so the first and last indices match. So we want to calculate these overlaps using the Euclidean gravitation path integral. So let's try. So to compute psi m, psi m prime, what do we do? I set up the boundary conditions for the shell m for the bra and m prime for the ket, or maybe it's the other way around. And then we sum over all paths. So then we compute the path integral to t equals zero. We sew the path integral across this. So then I'm doing a path integral with a disk and a boundary condition with a shell of mass m here and m prime there. And then I need to integrate over all geometries and all topologies, right? All fields. So I have the initial condition. I have the final condition. Sum over fields, geometries, and topologies of e to the minus i times the action, e to the minus the action. So the way in which we're instructed to do such a calculation in the semi-classical path integral, since we can't do it exactly anyway, right, is you're supposed to find all solutions to this with this boundary condition and stick it in, and then you'll get the sum over saddle points of e to the minus i saddle, and i, the action, is the same one we had before with you know, the usual gravity action. But in addition, there's the action of the shells floating around. And you put the stress energy and stuff like that, so you have to add that up and put that into the total action. So that's important. So what do you find? So it's important that we're doing the semi-classical approximation because it's an approximation. So to keep that in mind, that we're approximating the true quantum path integral, I'm going to just put an overbar over everything. That's just as a notation here to remind ourselves it's not the exact answer. It's a calculation of the semi-classical path integral. So let's calculate. Here is the first overlap, the straight overlap I want to compute. And it's pretty clear that if you try to compute this, you're going to get the delta function, the leading order, and then you will get something that's suppressed in e to the minus the mass difference of the shell. The reason there is such a term is you could imagine a complicated process where there's lots of splitting and joining of dust particles, this, that, and the other, you know, some process which converts one to the other that eventually gets it to the other. But that's going to be exponentially suppressed in the mass difference. And that is under my parametric control because I'm going to take m and m prime, be parametrically different in mass. I'm going to make that as small as I want, and I'm going to make it much smaller than the other effects I'm going to talk about in a minute. Right? So under parametric control, we can treat this as zero because I'll make it smaller by hand than any other effect I want to compute. Okay? So at this level, at this level, the dust ball states are approximately orthogonal. Not quite, but you know, I can make them as orthogonal as I want. 
because I have this infinite family of states to work with. Now, consider this overlap, psi m, psi m prime, psi m prime, psi m. This is an object that appears in the square of the gram matrix when you take the trace of the square. Well, if my instruction is, my boundary condition is I have a disk there with an m and m prime and m and m prime, well, one way of filling in that boundary is to put two disks, and then I try to connect shell m and shell m prime, and I'll get the same answer that I got before, that I'll get a delta function, delta m m prime, the disk, this, right, this, this, you get delta m m prime plus something that's exponentially suppressed in the mass difference. However, there is a bigger contribution. In this case, if it is true that in Euclidean gravity, you are instructed to sum over topologies, then for this boundary condition with an M and M prime and M prime, there's another topology, and that is the cylinder going between this and this. And this is a connected wormhole contribution in, in quantum gravity. And that's going to give you some finite answer. And so you can calculate that. That's just gluing conditions and action computations. And you know, it takes a little work, but uh, it's easy enough to do. And you will find the answer. Well, overall, you get some delta function con uh, contribution to the leading order by from this disconnected contribution to the path integral. And the second contribution, this wormhole, gives you z2 over z1, z1 z prime, where z2 here is the Gibbons Hawking partition function that we computed earlier at the beginning of the talk, except now evaluated at a black hole with twice the inverse temperature. And you have to square the whole thing, and there's a power of four, et cetera. And the square here has to do with the fact that in the end, we're going to get twice the area of the black hole, right? Because you have two horizons that are contributing. They did. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is because I'm going to take them. So it turns out that you will, if you, okay, so I left out a piece here, which is that we're going to take the masses of these shells to be very large. So when you do, for sufficiently large masses, the leading term is universal, and there's a subleading correction that you can write down involving the masses of the shells. But in the limit of the masses of each of these shells, it's very, very large. There's a universal overlap between them. Well, the first term is zero. Yes, exactly. You can control it because I'm going to because mass is under parametric control. Yeah, no, uh, I know. I, I understand. So we haven't been able to identify an issue with that argument. On the other hand, if you identify one, I would love to know and correct the calculation uh, appropriately. So as far as I can tell, if I take the masses M and M prime to be parametrically under control, it's important for us that we have this infinite family of states because you tell me how big your effect is and I'm going to bring it lower by making the mass, multiplying the masses by a factor of 10,000 to make the effect smaller, right? Yeah. It, it's clear that any effect you're going to get in the additional contribution to overlap is going to get parametrically suppressed in the mass difference. Amongst other things, these things are even spatially separated. If I take a mass M and M prime, then because of the equation of motion, they're in different places. So you need all kinds of complicated processes. It's not going to happen that this is a... Why? Now that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. So I'm gonna to have to accept that this is what I'm doing, and I can't answer your question as to why uh, it's, it is or isn't a problem that, that, uh, that the entry in the gram matrix for the, along the diagonal is bigger than one. Yeah. Yeah. We can normalize them. Does that help? We've normalized the overlap to be one. So the reason you get the Z beta to the fourth is that for the diagonal. So, but then why am I not writing it down that way? This is for M not equal to M prime. 
that you get this answer. But this is supposed to be normalized so that for the long diagonal, you get an overlap of one. So that's the normalization we're going to pick. I can't answer your question right now. So I have to go back and look at uh, what it is that we did with the normalization to make sure that the diagonal terms are indeed overlap one. Indeed, here it looks as though it's not, which is then an issue. But this is the answer that comes out for the off diagonal pieces in the case that you normalize the diagonal things to one. I will check up the answer and I will tell you. But good question. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. Yeah. Yeah. In any case, what you're going to do is you're going to guarantee when you do this calculation one way or the other, you're going to guarantee that the diagonal terms are one, right? In our, because that's what it means to have normalized states. That was, that was Ashok and Subhadat's point. The real question is what is the size of the off diagonal terms relative to that? Because that's what tells you that these are not orthogonal states. Yes. Yes. I don't know what the constraint is, but there is, but that, but that's, it's not relevant to what is the constraint, right? I mean, the point is that you can have, a, you don't have to do quantum mechanics. I can take a three-dimensional vector space and write down 50,000 vectors that all have length one and write down such a matrix. And there's no constraint in what the off-diagonal things are. It is what it is, right? Yes, so we're saying it can't be too large. It has to be, you, know, you have to a limited amount of solid elements. You can't make so. Well, unless you take two states that are right next to each other. Right, right. I mean. Yes, there is. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So there is a constraint on, there's a constraint that says, let's see, in D dimensions, if you have, if you throw in random vectors, for example, there are some statements. Uh, what is, how does it go? It goes like E to the minus uh, uh, S. It goes like E to the minus S, the overlaps. Indeed. And that's the kind of thing that's going to happen here. So you could interpret the states we're writing down as kind of like random vectors in a high dimensional space. So without saying the things I'm about to say next, we could, in fact, interpret them that way, and we would get the answer you're talking about. Let me just have some questions. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I can see kind of how the calculation will go because you'll have to. Why don't I just do the calculation? I don't know. Yeah. The thing that, that, that's worrying me is that, or maybe not worrying me, is that uh, you have a set of microstates which, where the overlaps are very uniform, right? That's why the graph yes. is over. Yes. But that's a particular choice of yes. microstates in this over. Control. Yes. Because I'm going to tell you it overlaps with everything. So, so, uh, yeah. so you can do a similar argument. Oops, you can do a similar argument for the higher moments and so on. Let me just skip it because um, you get the picture of what's going. On. So, what's the micro? I'm going to talk about the microscopic interpretation of this, and then we'll do the calculation. So, we found that this overlap was delta m m prime equals zero. This. So, actually. The diagonal terms, in fact, because we've normalized it appropriately, does not contain the additional piece. So this is answering your question. I just uh, uh, need to go back and make sure about that. But indeed, the diagonal terms are normalized to be delta m and prime. And then the off-diagonal terms involve, well, this is zero, and then it has this thing. So how is this possible? Because this seems like it can't work because the square of this number is not this thing. So a proposal you might have is that the semi-classical Euclidean saddle points are intrinsically averaging over microstates that vary in tiny Planck scale detail. So this is related to the things that people have been talking about, about ensembles and what have you, but there is no fundamental ensemble here. It's a statement about when you calculate semi-classical things, it is a coarse-grained object. What does that coarse-grained object do? So suppose it is the case that you have uh, states with the same macroscopic description, um, but you know, microscopic details are different. Let's suppose that the overlap, or that the matrix elements of such different dust shells in the energy basis involve some smooth part, which is the kind of thing that we've been looking at in some sense, and some erratic phases. Let's suppose that's the case. This is just a, a, an interpretation of this. Suppose that's the case. If that is the case, 
right? And that you'd have to show in detail for the microscopic theory, which we don't have access to, but it's supposed to be chaotic because of the theory of gravity, et cetera. So it's plausible. Then you can show that were you to work out these kinds of overlaps of the kind we're doing, you would find out that this overlap would be zero unless A equals B, and that if you take this kind of square of the overlap, you'd get not zero because it so happens that because this A and this A match up, the random phases cancel in the calculation and you wind up getting something that is, uh, you pick up the smooth part, right? The random phase is actually canceled. So that's why we would like to claim, you can do this and why you shouldn't be perturbed that this is zero indeed, if M is not equal to M prime and this is not zero. Okay, so now we're almost done. If you give me two minutes and you keep your son waiting at the airport for two minutes, we will actually be done. So let's count the microstates. We want to compute the trace of the resolvent. And so by uh, using the fact that this thing are moments of the overlaps, and we've already computed these overlaps or claimed to compute these overlaps, you can do some massaging and get this form. We can get a recursion relation basically for the trace of the resolvent. These are again, standard techniques that appear in the literature. Then I should be honest that what we've been doing so far is actually we've been doing the canonical ensemble and the canonical ensemble Every, you know, uh, thermal states have support on the entire Hilbert space. So if you want to count states, you should project on microscopic canonical ensemble. So you have to do an inverse Laplace transform on everything in sight in order to project everything onto the inver into the microcanonical ensemble. So you have some integrals to do in various places. And so then if you take the microcanonical version of this and sum it up, you get an equation of this form. I probably shouldn't have written S. I should have probably written E to the A over four G Newton because that's what comes up. That's going to be the entropy later. So you sum it up, you get this as the answer. So then if you compute the density of eigenvalues, it turns out there's some smooth part. And then at zero, you get a theta function of this kind. So what does this mean? Suppose omega, omega is the dimension of the gram matrix we're talking about. It's how many states we put into our bag of dust balls. So if omega is less than e to the s, there are no, there are no vanishing eigenvalues. So basically then the dimension and the rank of the matrix are omega. If omega is bigger than e to the s, then according to this, there are omega minus e to the s vanishing eigenvalues. So that tells you that the rank of the gram matrix is, is e to the s. You can't get it to be any more than e to the s, where s is equal to a over four g newton. So now we need to argue that this is a complete basis. So the way in which I will try to argue that is uh, in the negative one minute and a half, is that the OPE of any operator contains the stress tensor. And of course, there are diagrams in which the stress tensor therefore can turn to any other operator. So basically the states that we're constructing have overlaps with every state you can possibly write down. In some sense, this is because, you know, in this theory that you have gravity, right? And everything can merge into the graviton and the graviton can turn to everything else. Indeed, all our overlaps are computed through gravity. Right? It's the universal semi-classical overlap that's getting produced because of the effects of gravity. Okay, and what's more along that line, the wormhole overlaps, as you noted earlier, Sudrat, don't actually care about which operator we used because in the end they cared about, you know, the masses of this and that and everything, not even that mattered for sufficiently heavy states. Okay, so um, we can do this also for collapsing black holes. And the, yeah, Loga, can I, can I just take two more minutes because I think no, I know Sudrat has to leave. So let me just finish the story and then we can take your question. So, so just to continue quickly, so for collapsing black holes, the kind of story you'd tell is here's a collapsing black hole, you know, shell of matter falls in. I take the slice omega and I want to know what are the states on that slice omega. Now I can consider adding to this, this is an asymptotically flat space. Now I can consider a microstate like this, where there is a shell of matter moving around behind the horizon. Now, if you run that shell of matter, this microstate backward in time, what you'll get is a geometry that's entirely different from this collapsing shell geometry. So you might say to me, why is this a valid microstate? And the answer is, suppose I take the gas in this room and I take this particular configuration of gas and I count the entropy. Well, that includes a configuration of gas in this room that 15 minutes ago, all the gas molecules were in one corner of the room. That's not what, what made the actual gas in the room right now, but it contributes to the entropy because the point of entropy is that if you have a coarse observer who pushes on the system, you're counting the phase space of things that a configuration that can interact with at that time. And that includes these kinds of shells. So you should indeed, for even a collapsing black hole, think about this kind of thing as 
microstates. They're there and contribute to the coarse-grained entropy of the system. Another side comment is about the volume of the wormholes. So each of these shells produces, if I put two shells, three shells, et cetera, makes a longer and longer wormhole. But all of these things have these kind of universal overlaps you mentioned. And therefore, as I've claimed, you can expand very long, super exponential wormholes, shall we say, in these smaller ones of smaller mass. So what that immediately tells you is that volume cannot be a linear operator in quantum gravity, because if it were a linear operator, then the long wormhole would have, let's say, a volume that's a sum, a weighted sum, of the volumes of small wormholes, which then can't be true. That's relevant, of course, for things like uh, there are people who want to think about complexity and volume and things of this kind, and it's relevant for that thinking, because you know, whatever, if, if it's true that there is some connection in ADS-CFD, that the dictionary for ADS-CFD relates volume to some notion of complexity, whatever that notion is, definitely not in any way a linear operator in the CFD. So that's, that's an important point for that program of things. So I'll end here. So, I mean, that to me raises another set of questions. Why can't we detect all these states from far away? Indeed, why does it appear to be a horizon? This is in some tension with a kind of fuzzball kind of thing, right? These are all things that are sitting behind the horizon. And the answer that is work in progress by many people is that it's possible that the states in question are protected from interference from the outside by their complexity. Basically, simple operators or simple observers of any kind cannot possibly interfere with these states. So to all intents and purposes, it acts as if they're causally disconnected, but they aren't in some way. So that's, that's a possibility for people thinking about. I'll stop there. Uh, that, that, that's it. I'll stop there. <laughs> so that, I'll catch you tomorrow. Yeah, Loga. Yeah. yeah. The, which one? This one? Yeah. How you find this and this? Yeah. So you compute this object. So this is this is a calculation where let's see. So you have this formula for the trace of the resolvent. All these things we supposedly calculate, you know, using the Euclidean path integral. Stick it all in. And using the wormholes and the gravity and all of that. So that gives you a bunch of numbers for this. From that, you take some traces and everything. And so you can write down a recursion relation from that. That's also standard from the literature and so on. And it will take this form. These things uh, you won't recognize, but these things are the, uh, you know, these traces have come in over here. They're built in. So now you can look at this recursion relation. And now you can sum this up. So by summing, by solving this recursion relation, you find that, and well, you also do some projections and so on. At the end of it, when you do that calculation, you, know, you, you project it and then you do the sums, you find that you get a quadratic equation for the trace of the resolvent. This is the quadratic equation. Now it's high school. So you solve the quadratic equation right? and, um, and work out from it um, the trace of the resolvent. What, oh, sorry? Yes. This piece here. Uh, possibly so, but I can't answer your question. You know, all we did here was the absolutely naive solve for the solve the quadratic equation and look at what happens at a uh, 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 delta. You, you know, write down this this answer and check what how, you know what the density of eigenvalues is at zero. So now, in the matrix model language, there may be you know exchanges of dominance and things like that. In fact, you could probably suspect that there'd be stuff like that, but we haven't looked at it at all, so I can't really give you a precise answer. Fill it in. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, 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 what does the spread look like? Okay. So, I can't tell. I can't tell you what the picture looks like because I don't remember. But um, a relevant point that you're probably going after is that if this thing goes like this, then you get some contribution at zero from the continuous part, and you have to worry about that. So, actually, whatever it is, it goes to zero there, and then climbs up, and then goes down. I think that. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Can you just explain this completeness? I mean, how to do? Yeah. Sure. So I feel this is the loosest part of the argument. So the um, uh, so this is what I would like to argue, right? and uh, any way of making this as precise as possible, you know, I'd be grateful for. Right? If anybody has comments. So the argument is like this. So we've computed these overlaps. The overlaps look universal. So first of all, let's consider different aspects of the completeness. So one is suppose they made shells from this kind of dust versus that kind of dust, right? Would, wouldn't that make a difference? And the answer is no, because no matter what kind of dust you make the shell out of, the overlap is controlled by gravity. So one way of thinking about that is really why is there overlap? It's because the thing, the shell you make, gets dressed by the gravity. In other words, emitting gravitons in some sense. The gravitons can get eaten by the other shell, because of course it can, gravity is universal, and it's made of other stuff, but I don't care. That interaction, produces some overlap, it's universal. So in this sense, you can, you know, there's the same overlap for these very heavy shells, regardless of what you make them out of. That is the first critical part of that argument. Right. So, so you have to make sure that arbitrary linear combinations still have on the overlap. I mean, suppose you make the same sum yeah. of small masses. I mean, you say that you have to take the last yes. limit, right? To make sure that the yes. correct. Yes, yes. So, yeah. I'm going to take small masses. Yes. So that's trickier to argue for the small masses because we haven't computed their overlaps. However, it's perfectly plausible that there's some overlap there. Indeed, you can see that there is some overlap. It just doesn't take a completely universal form. So certainly it's plausible that there's an overlap. I would also say that the number of small mass shells is you know, completely negligible in the entropy. So for example, if it turned out that they weren't covered, they would make a subleading contribution to the entropy anyway, because there are so few of them compared to the things that we're calculating. So there are very few, in other words, there are very few small mass shells relative to these heavy shells. Why? Because if you make them by putting in dust particles, for example, how many dust particles are you using? Right? If I use three dust particles, there are only so many ways of putting three dust particles in the, in, on the shell. Whereas if you give me 10,000 particles, there are many more ways. Another way of saying this is if I take the shell and I discretize it into K bins, you know, uh, and I can make K up to Planck size, the number of possible ways, configurations of putting, you know, <laughs> uh, the number of particles in is growing very rapidly with the number of particles you have. When you eventually reach the grain size, then of course, then you, it'll come back down, but we don't have to worry about that because we're never going to get to the Planck densities anyway. So that's the argument. Does that, would you agree with that? So, so. Yeah, um, uh, so, so I'm perfectly, uh, uh, this is something we worry about, right? So, uh, so uh, I, I can't even tell you how much time we have spent on late night Zoom <laughs> calls you know, discussing the degree to which we believe that part of the argument. Um, so, but uh, at the level that uh, I can say it, I would say exactly this, for the heavy shells, it's true that they, uh, that you know, all of this is you know we understand. For the light shells, you know, there's some overlap. Uh, it's a uh, uh, um, we can compute it. We haven't. Maybe we should be trying to do that more carefully. It'll depend. It'll depend in those cases on what the masses are. Uh, it won't be this universal answer. Um, the overlaps are not are, are not you know significantly smaller than this or anything like that. They're of the same magnitude because it's still being controlled by the same you know there's some gravitational action. There'll be an e to the minus gravitational action like that. So it's not going to be in of, of different magnitude. So at order of magnitude level, it's the same. We just haven't been very careful about doing that, about you know, calculating that in, very, in, in great detail. But you know, there's a, it's the same order of magnitude, so I should expect it to work out. And in any case, I do really believe that the argument is correct, that the number of low mass shells of that kind is just exponentially smaller than these heavy things. So it's a subleading correction. That's the, that's the argument. And I would love to make that more precise. You'd prefer an argument here that uh, at least in the ads CFT setting, maybe there's some way of just making this exact, right? Arguing that the basis of operators you create by taking these sort of very heavy combinations of things is complete. That should be an argument that we can directly make 
in the dual field theory, but we haven't made it. So I can't give you that as a precise answer. I have a question. Uh, Spenta. Hi. Uh, so we know that uh, black holes are formed by infalling shells of matter. Yes. And uh, in some sense, uh, you know, whatever you throw in uh, forms this black hole. Yes. And uh, now you want to study the, in a sense, we are trying to study the interior of this black hole. Yes. All these degrees of freedom uh, that you're invoking in the, uh, you know, the matter that's uh, essentially being emitted from the singularity, uh, in a sense, is modeling the interior of the black hole, right? And you will just do what reproduces the entropy correctly. Is that a correct understanding of your? So this is this is this is uh, so uh, 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 so yes in the following sense I would say. So if I look in the interior of the black hole, there could be many many configurations that coarse grain to the same black hole outside. Most of those configurations, uh, uh, you know, if I look at a typical configuration, which is some crazy superposition, I would say of our state here, some crazy random looking superposition. There's no guarantee that that object will look anything like a shell that's floating around. It is, you know, you maybe can interpret it as a quantum superposition of shells, but I already argued here that very long wormholes are superpositions of very small wormholes. So that's a crazy thing. It's very hard to imagine. Right? I mean, huge thing is a superposition of small things. So in that sense, a crazy superposition of the shells could be, I don't know, maybe it can look like the usual uh, analytic continuation of the exterior to the inside. Maybe it can be that some of these superpositions look like D-brains of Strominger and Waffa. Maybe some of them look like fuzzballs. So I don't know, right? But all of those things are possibilities. So, but certainly this is supposed to be a, a basis, uh, we would claim, for anything that you could put behind the horizon. So, and thus the interior. I didn't mean that uh, the infalling shells that make the black hole is something that you are reconstructing. I didn't mean that actually. I mean, I meant that the black hole is equilibrated. There's an object there. Uh -huh. And you want to figure out what's going on inside, in some sense, a model. Yes. And uh, you are giving that model in terms of this uh, dust. Yes. OK. In that sense, I was. OK. I think, I think that's, that's fair, right? And they were doing this the equilibrated. The instantons, actually, that. Uh, what's that? The wormholes are like instantons. The wormholes instantons. are like instantons. And they are calculating the uh, entropy. They are, the, the wormholes are like instantons that compute some non perturbative contributions yes. to the overlaps of these things. Right? That's the way we would think about this. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, sort of uh, following up on that, uh, when you compute the overlap of G to the N, uh, the, uh, the, I, I, uh, you showed like with two, you get uh, yeah. Z to two B. But uh, when you take N very large, can't you have other contributions? So have we looked for other for other saddle points? Yeah, that could be when N is. I mean, when it's yeah. two, maybe it's uh, maybe it's, it's okay. obvious, right? So in two, we found these, and we're pretty confident that these are it. But then, you know, likely our imagination fails us. That's a possible failure mode of this calculation, right? So the assertion would here have to be that this is the dominant saddle point for very large N, but we can't justify that. It's certainly, well, there's no replicas here. It's certainly, I forget, I, I, I said a bad word, replica. Uh, so, so, but uh, it's certainly, you know, symmetric and, you know, has all those kinds of good traits, but who knows, right? I mean, so, so we can't guarantee that either, but answer analysis, namely this gives the correct answer, suggests that a thing to show, a target calculation, a thing to demonstrate is that there are no, that this is the dominant saddle point, that there are no other saddle points either that dominate over this or that sum up many subleading saddle points that sum up to be dominant over this. They should be absent would be the claim here. Uh, we haven't shown that. Beyond a certain end, uh, yeah. an end yeah. or, or the one of yeah. or something that Yeah. Uh, just some order of limits. Maybe. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so, so uh, accepted, uh, and I, uh, we don't have a calculation showing that one way or the other. So going back to one of the comments I think Loga made earlier, one way of thinking about, well, another way, if you don't like the nth moment, a quick and dirty way of doing this is you take the second moment, and then you take the square root of that, and take that square root of that to be an estimate of the overlap between these states. And then your random vector in a high dimensional space argument applies. And you will find that these look like random, these have the overlap 
which has the size of random vectors in a space of dimension e to the s using just the second moment. So we didn't do that argument, but we could have because we sort of felt like sort of going all the way to these eigenvalues and everything somehow felt like a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, so the, you can make two statements. We compute these overlaps and we agree that it is not a strange thing to say that the second, that the moment squared, that the moment, that the, the overlap is zero, you know, to leading order, but the moment, but the square with the, with the appropriate trace is non-zero. Let's first admit, agree that that is not, uh, 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 that doesn't make the calculation wrong, because if there was an ETH thing going on, something like that would happen. Let's just agree with that. Now, suppose you've admitted to that, then you can say, well, but then I can take the square root. Uh, so these are supposed to be like random vectors in the ETH sense. Then I can take the square root of the second moment to just figure out the overlap uh, between you know, the any pair of these things, right? Or, or the typical overlap, because they're all the same overlaps. And then you'll find that the answer tells you that you're in a dimension, a space of dimension. If these are random vectors, then this is a dimension, a space of dimension e to the black hole entropy. So that would be another argument you could make, which wouldn't take us into the large n kind of worries, large moment worries. I have a slightly different question. So we started with an overcomplete basis of semi-classical microstates. And then you computed these overlaps and you found that the dimension should be smaller than what you naively thought. Can I interpret this? Is it fair to say that uh, this result implies that there exists a basis in which all microstates of the black hole can be semi-classical? Well, no. That's because I could take two, if I take the superposition of two tennis balls, it's not semi-classical, right? It's one half this, it's one over root two this, and one over root two that, you know. That's just, it's, it's not semi-classical. Another way of saying this is that, um, if you found uh, so in the quantum gravity setting, if you found two geometries with the same asymptotics, you could imagine that in quantum cosmology, the state of the world is an even superposition between these two things, and the geometries could be very different from each other. An example of a situation where you could do such a thing, uh, you know, in string theory, very precisely, would be like this. So, uh, do you know these uh, LLM Lin Lunen Malasena geometries? Okay, so these are in ADS five. Uh, they are nice classical geometries, topologically very complex. You know, in some of these solutions, there's a there's an S3 here, and some of the solutions there's an S3 there. It's all very complicated, but very different classically. Nothing stops me from taking one over root two this plus one over root two that, or whatever superposition you want. And the resulting object, if you try to compute, for example, the expected value of the metric, or something like that, you might imagine that in the full quantum theory, the expected value of the metric, in some sense. Um, is the thing you write down as the semi-classical description. So if you take these kinds of geometries, superpose them, compute the expected value of the metric, you'll get some answer. The fluctuations will be very large, and you can't describe the semi-classical. There's some paper I wrote with Don Moral from the subjects. But I think the question was whether there is one basis in which all the basis states are semi-classical. Well, I that would one. be that case, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I could take any first e to the s, yeah. and presumably that will form a Yeah, basis. you could take any e to the s of these states, and the claim is that this is a semi-classical basis for all microstates of the black hole. That's the claim. So, so, so the claim is a bit on the dramatic side. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, because you could take all those bases, right, confined region, and then anything outside, far away, yeah. will be a linear superposition of those, right? Uh, I didn't understand that comment. What is that? What? I mean, inside the uh, so the black hole. The black hole so yeah. these are all inside the black hole. Yeah, we are all inside the black hole, right? Yeah. We take these various cells. Yeah. Okay. Calculate their overlap. Yes. Uh, 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 there's some overlap. Take e to the s of them. Yes. Right. And uh, then we can pick another one, which is at least classically very different from. Correct. Correct. Any correct. Other, right. Yes. Another set of e to the s of, of these things, which are very different from these. Yeah. Even one. Oh. Okay. Which looks very different from any other. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. And you can, right? Because you. I, so you give me the first e to the s. And then you pick some other one. Well, I, there are, I know the overlaps. So I'll just write down the overlaps between them and I'll give you the answer. The phases is another question, by the way. I know the magnitudes of the overlaps from the Euclidean calculation. Those are these e to the minus s type things. But the actual phases you need, we have no control over. This has something to do with Subrat's question. So if you ask a question that depends on the phases, which in this case involves what is the precise superposition you need to write down to give me this other shell, 
I can't tell you the answer because I have, don't have access to the phases in the Euclidean calculation. So hopefully that may help clarify that point. I mean, a simple example of this kind of thing, this wormhole thing that I was saying at the end is like that. So one of the very long wormholes contains, let's say, uh, a billion shells separated by large distances. It makes this very long wormhole. We would be claiming that that thing can be written down as a superposition of many of these single shell geometries. Right? In fact, we can compute the overlaps and we can tell you what the magnitude of the overlap of each of these single shell geometries is. So I can write it down, but I don't know the phases. So I can't write down the actual quantum superposition. Why don't you know the phases? Because the formula that we wrote yeah. was directly for the inner product, right? Or the, yeah. is it more square of the inner product? Well, so the, the leading term in the direct inner product yeah. is zero for these different geometries. And you get a piece that's because, because that's because the idea is that what the um, Euclidean path integral is computing is an average over all of the slightly different microscopic configurations that have the same macroscopic description. Because you know, we're computing overlap in semi-classical gravity, right? So when we say semi-classical microstate, what do we mean? We mean whatever the microstate is, it has a reliable description at coarse scales as a classical geometry. That is, there is no guarantee when you say that, that even for a regular material, that if you go really to the microscopic scale, that you, know, uh, that you know in detail where everything is, you don't. So the Euclidean path integral better lose some data about the true microscopics. And so the kind of style of argument here is the data it's losing, if I think in an energy basis, for example, is the phases in the superposition. You don't have access to that because the only things that you can calculate are, are averaged over those things that are microscopically different in that but sense. The phases being averaged will give you zero, right? Correct but not for the particular objects that we, for the, you remember the squared overlaps. If you look at the indices in those things, they are such the phases cancel. So, 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 so this is also partly going after the question of there've been these various miracles apparently happening in the last few years. So where the square came from? I mean, maybe in the, it's, it's in, a it, uh, in right? the, it came from yeah. the requirement that we're taking some trace. So, so here we take the, uh, if you look at this, we take the trace of G, oops. We're taking the trace of the gram matrix to the N, right? Okay. So the gram matrix, and then there's some trace. Yeah, yeah. But the calculation that you did, the Euclidean gravity calculation, the path integral, yeah, this is. So if you look at this, whoops. Yeah. See this? M, see. M prime, M, M prime. Okay. So, so it's important that you do, that you do, that you get that. If you didn't do that, you'd get zeros, right? If they wanted, these, if, if these were different M's, you'd get zero still. And so you might say then, so then, so then the question is, why isn't this a crazy answer, right? This is this wrong. And, and it would make complete sense in a conventional interpretation. If, if you compute semi-classical objects, you're gonna coarse grain over some details of the microscopic theory. We know there's a microscopic theory that should somehow complete this. And it's clear that there'll be Planck scale differences in these shells you can make that'll produce the same semi-classical description. So it's impossible to accept that you know, everything you calculate in semi-classical gravity gives you exact information about the microscopic theory. That can't be right. And so here, part of the goal here is to identify which pieces from the microscopic theory you have access to and which you don't. There are clearly some things that you don't. So for example, the answer to your question, what is the precise superposition of this other crazy shell in terms of these shells? Well, we can tell you the magnitudes, but we can't tell you the phases. So also this is supposed to go after the question of, you know, as I was saying a moment ago, it felt in the last few years, like there are these miracles happening, right? You know, you do some, some simple Euclidean calculation, all of a sudden, you know, page curve, this, that, and the other, right? it's, like, it's, it's like magic, right? Um, so why is the Euclidean path integral telling us so much information? I think this is supposed to, and, and I don't personally subscribe to the idea that there is any fundamental ensemble. That just sounds really weird to me. I've seen no reason to pick that as an explanation. The idea here is that it's the conventional thing. If you compute semi-classical things, it's going to coarse grain something. And the proposal here is that the precise way it coarse grains is it averages over all the microstates, the true, you know, down there at the Planck scale microstates that have the same semi-classical description. Because you know, it's going to compute something. It's either going to average over them or it's going to pick one of them or it's going to do something. 
and you know, a conservative interpretation, it sort of averages over them. I actually think what's actually going on is like an analytic continuation. So suppose you have a bunch of poles along the real line, and then you have some other structure out here in the, along the complex line. Then if you do a, a contour integral here, that's the same thing as doing contour integral over all of these. The analytic function produces the same data around this pole. I think what we need is an understanding of the saddle point calculations of Euclidean gravity in that way. But there's an analytic continuation thing going on. But these saddle point values are calculating a sum over certain things that course grain to the same Euclidean geometry. So that's what I think is really going on. And that's why everything in the last few years has worked the way it does. So that's another thing that you know, we're, we're thinking about. And I, that's, I think, also the, probably one of the key lessons for me from this work. Cut. <laughs> we have to stop. I had a question. What's that? I had a. I haven't even tried to compute this. So you can get them from higher, for example, higher derivative theories that should be subleading terms and stuff like that. So we haven't even tried to compute them yet. But I, uh, I know some groups are trying to do that. So Rajesh has, to, has waved to me that I need to stop because of. <laughs> Excuse me. Hello. Is there a, can you ask the question? Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. Who is this? It's from the Zoom link. Ah, I'll, I'll join you. Where, where will you be? In the okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah, so I'm uh, extremely interested in modified gravity theories, uh, such as skeleton cell vector gravity. And I was just hoping if you can comment uh, anything if we look at this uh, microstates of black holes under that yeah. lens. So uh, uh, if I heard your question correctly, this is about modified gravity theories. So this would be like things you get from uh, Galileons, you know, things of the nature and so on? Yeah, so uh, there's okay. this uh, so, skeleton cell vector gravity. Uh, so I was... Um, extremely interested in that. So I was just hoping if you can comment on anything on that, regarding that. Well, I mean, so um, a wonderful thing, in my opinion, and also a somewhat unnerving thing, in my opinion, about the calculation I described is I don't see any particular obstacle with trying to do these calculations in those theories. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is uh, the calculation says, what does it need? It needs that you have a black hole, that you have a Euclidean construction, that you can put shells and stuff behind that are solutions to the stuff and you can compute the overlaps. So uh, that to me feels unnervingly like, well, maybe it's not unnerving. Uh, that's, that appears to say that any theory that has general relativity plus corrections as its low energy limit, you can treat in this way. And the idea would be you should get the correct black hole entropy formula for those cases. And if there's a modification, the A over four G Newton in the theory, you should be able to find the modification of that theory using this kind of argument. So I would claim that that is true. Right, so if you're in your mother, in your different theory of gravity, if the formula for black hole entropy isn't A over 4G Newton, but it has some correction, you should be able to get it. And that would be a test of whether or not this formalism is reasonable to think about. The reason why I find that unnerving is I do have some kind of commitment to the idea that a theory of gravity ought to have a UV completion. And I personally used to think that black hole entropy was a entry point into the question of what is the UV complete, what is a valid UV completion? So I find it slightly confusing that I didn't have to use anything from the ultraviolet theory in any substantive way in, in the computation, which is why I'm saying that you know your modified theory of gravity, it should all work out too. You should be able to get it. I think what's going on probably is some subtle assumption about the existence of the path integral and the notion that the full path integral can be well approximated in this semi-classical way. If your theory doesn't have a UV completion, then I imagine that actually the true path integral is not well approximated by the semi-classical thing. That, that's what I think should be happening. But those are just words, and I can't give you further justification on that. No, thank you very much. That was really helpful. Let's thank Vijay Bang.